Right, today we're going to do a review of a system that to us in England is well known and to those in America is probably not too well known. It's a uh, British based system from the BBC no less and uh, it is the BBC Master System. But because this is a system uh, by the BBC, sort of, I think that uh, as the BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation, I need to be wearing the attire that is more suitable. Okay, right. I think this is a bit more suitable. Okay, it's not perfect. I don't have my tie. But I prefer to think of this as smart cash. So, the BBC Master System. Well, BBC Master. What exactly is it? Well, before we look at the specifications of the system, I think it's important to uh, have a, look, a little bit of a look behind the history of the system so we can understand where this thing is coming from. In around about 1980, the BBC, known as the British Broadcasting Corporation, decided it was going to launch a computer literacy project and get the UK leading in knowledge of computers. To do this, the BBC decided they were going to create a programme called the Computer Programme. Yes, highly imaginative, I know. But to allow you people to uh, follow along with the programme, they decided they were going to put bids out for a computer that could be used with the programme. To do this, the BBC decided to put out tenders for companies to produce the computer. They put out uh, offers to Sinclair, Newbury, Dragon and Acorn. Now originally the Newbury Newbrain was going to be accepted, Sinclair's offer not being seen as a very viable offer due to many limitations their tender had, which we'll see in another programme. At the last minute Newbury pulled out, leaving Acorn in the lead. Now Acorn had produced uh, a system that was far greater than the specifications uh, that the BBC wanted. Uh, they'd already been developing a system called the Proton and that got changed to the original BBC Micro. The original BBC Micro was launched in 1981 and originally had 16K which was later uh, increased in the B to 32K and then in 1986 came the BBC Master which we're going to look at now. now this is a picture of the BBC B just to show you what it looked like before it went to the Master and here well, we have the BBC Master in all its glory as you can see it was expanded off to the right to give it its own numeric keypad and to give it two handy dandy ROM slots Memory has also risen from the original 64K of the last machine to 128K in here. On the top we have the function keys which are assignable, assignable like macros and that's remembered when the system is switched off because it has uh, batteries to uh, keep its memory. Uh, it has a brake key which is used to reset it. Uh, there's two levels of set but we'll look at that in a moment. Got the keypad, the two slots, and the speaker. Uh, you can get sound going out the back on this if you plug in external speakers, obviously. But for the most of it, of the time, the, the, the sound comes out the speaker here. So let's have a look at the back of this thing. Now, one of the things the system was always praised for greatly is its expandability and adaptability, also as well as the quality of its uh, operating system. And here you can see why. Let's have a look at some of these ports here. Okay, starting from the left here, you have the Econet port. What this allowed was several of these computers 
quite a few of these computers in fact to be connected together and to share printers and hard drives yes you could get a hard drive for these although they were about a thousand pounds for 30 megabyte next to that you have the audio out and we all know what that is so you can get audio on an external system next to that you have a cassette drive port and this will actually take disk drive discs or cassettes because it's this is the computer this is a computer at the time when we're just coming out of cassette era next to that you have an rs432 port next to that an analog port for use with monitors an rgb port composite video port and a uhf port down the end here we have the uh, the power unit with its on off switch nothing too exciting there unless it goes up in smoke which these have been known to do now and again so all in all that means this system has one two three four five six seven eight eight ports that is incredible for any system but with this system the expandability does not end there because next we have a look at the wonderment that is the underneath the system. All right, I've turned the system upside down. This is the front of the computer looking towards the back, obviously. And you can immediately see there's even more stuff underneath. So let's have a look at the wonderment of this stuff here. Okay, first of all, on the left, you've got uh, what's called the tube connector, which is used for connecting uh, a second processor to the system allowing the second processor which is faster to take over the graphics and leaving the processor in here to do the IO. Next to that we have a 1 megahertz buzz. This is used for connecting the system to things such as hard disks. Next to that we have the user port. Now People may be familiar with Logo and its little uh, turtle uh, robot. This is what was used to connect the turtle and other things such as that. Next to that, we have a printer port and a disk drive port. And it's not finished there because over here we have an extra power port so that any peripherals can get power from the system here. Now to bring you outside the system again, you'll notice on the right hand side I said there's two ROM ports. Now these were for connecting uh, obviously ROM chips which would have programs in, uh, games, uh, educational programs and things like Pascal. Now here I have a ROM cartridge holder and this holds two of them. As you can see here, I've got Xmon 2 and Bbug Help. And these just fit in here, slot in. And when in use like that, this does not take up, uh, the programs sitting in there do not take up memory. Whereas the, pro the chips you can put inside do. And I'm going to show you that right now. But to do that, I quickly need to undress it. Okay, here we can see the inside, and up the side here, you can't see it up now, but I'll show you in a second, is where the extra ROM chips can go. Okay, on the right hand side here, you can see where the uh, ROM slots are, where that clips in. Sadly, that's the speaker, which thankfully is very easily removed, it just clips in a little thing down there. And with that out of the way, you can see these ROM chips here, just the and you can fit ROMs in each of these allowing you to have built-in programs which you can access obviously from the main screen which is a really brilliant idea but they do take up memory so if you can get them in the ROM folder because that doesn't sit in resident menu now another beauty of this system is when you want to put information into it it can either take sets three and a quarter inch discs or five and a quarter inch discs such as the one I have here with Repton the Lost Realms on it. So I can feed it into this uh, 
dual drive Vigilin uh, system that I have here. Two drives, drive zero, drive one, and they both read front and back and both adaptable to either 80 tracks or 40 tracks switchable, which is very nice. Now the unusual thing about the BBC is obviously it's data communications cables and you'll see on this one. This is a data communication cable. Yes, it looks like the one's out the inside of a PC. In fact, I think they are. But that's what plugs in. The easy, the other good thing about this is it's so easy to load off it. Unlike other systems where you have to go through daft routines or typing a load to uh, load off the disk drive with the BBC, you just press shift and break and off it comes. Another beauty of the Beeb's operating system is resetting it. Now with a lot of systems of this age, you have to switch them off, switch them back on. Not with this one. You can just press the brake key and that resets the system. There's even a little hole there where you can put a screwdriver in to lock out the brake system if you would like using it in educational things with children so they didn't accidentally knock the software off. Now obviously you're going to want to be able to see what your BBC is doing and there are many options to connect. You can connect to a normal TV or any old monitor that accepts RGB. But for the real retro feeling there is only one choice and that's the Micro VTech Cub monitor. This, as you can hear, is made of metal and it's one of the Ferrari monitors of its age. It produces a crystal clear picture and you just can't get better for the Beeb. And it's the monitor that came with it originally. So for that retro proper feeling, that's the one for you. So here is my master system, all plugged in, ready to go and ready to play me some zap. You'll also notice that with mine, I also have a dot matrix printer at the top, which was uh, traditional for the time and uh, extremely noisy. Now I will be putting some uh, links up for vi uh, videos to the games at the end of the review but this is a more review of the hardware so uh, links to come. So the BBC or the Beeb Master 128K, mm, 128K, mm. is it for you? Well if you use one of these at school you might run screaming at the thought of it, it might bring back memories of uh, Granny's Garden etc. But that's just the point, it was used at schools for a good reason. It's bloody good. For its age and its generation, it's extremely powerful. It has a very good operating system, very good uh, basic, and a hell of a lot of uh, software produced for it, both games and educational. And you can also get solid state drives to put in here that you can put a lot of the ROMs from your disk images on. So you don't even have to get the disk drive for it. It's brilliant. Uh, the Americans, well, it's a system you've probably never used. And it's a very good system, so still get it. My recommendation, get it. Get yourself a BBC B as well, because they're good. Thank you. Thank you.